Hi again. This is the last mini lecture uh, as part of series five. And I want to talk about a really smart fellow, a guy by the name of Helmholtz. He figured out back in the 1800s that mm, sensations ambiguous and perceptions got to rely on cognitive processes. Didn't use that language. He used a concept called unconscious inferences. And the idea there is that unconsciously, outside of our awareness, we are drawing inferences. We're, we're making assumptions. We're, we're taking our best guess as to what's actually out there in the world, given the stimulation uh, of our retina. So Helmholtz argued that we infer much of what we know about the world. We're taking our best guess. Uh, another way of saying taking your best guess is the likelihood principle. This is, again, another Helmholtzian idea that because uh, images and stimuli are ambiguous, we have to infer what they actually represent in the real world. And to make that inference, we make, we unconsciously interpret the stimulation as whatever our brain figures out is the most likely interpretation, the most probable. What is most likely, given our past experiences, right? Um, so let's look at this uh, um, slide. Um, on the far right, you can see, um, well, what you, what you might see is a white square in front of four black circles. That's probably the most common interpretation, uh, but it could also be, um, I don't know, do you guys, do you ever, have you ever seen the old Pac-Man game? Waka, 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 waka. Okay, if you have, um, then this, you realize you might interpret the same figure, not as three or sorry, four black circles in a white square, but simply as four Pac-Men with their mouths half open. Uh, if you haven't seen the Pac-Man game, then what I just said doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So instead, what you could interpret this as is imagine um, four dark pies and a quarter of each pie was cut out. So you have three quarters left. Either interpretation is perfectly good, but Helmholtz argued we pick the interpretation that is the most likely given our past experiences. I haven't seen too many walk waka waka, Pac-Men walking around in the world. So I look at that stimulus and see a white square in front of four black circles. Um, on the left side is another example of the likelihood principle. We'll circle back to this later, but basically that's the same picture on the left and on the right. Um, it's gray with a lot of little circles drawn out. Uh, in one case, those so circles might look like divots, like holes, and in the other case, they might appear like protrusions, right, sticking out. Um, and again, that's going to, well, we'll see what that depends on in a second. So we pick interpretations of stimuli that are represent the most likely interpretation, right? And you can see that in um, the drawings on the left side here with the blue and the red square. What's more likely that I see um, two rectangles, one partially occluding the other, or that there's just one blue rectangle and a sort of partial figure that just so happens to connect, well, that's terrible, just so happens to connect perfectly with the edges of the square. That seems less likely. So what we perceive is one rectangle in front of the other because it's more likely. Um, the uh, picture on the right is uh, an interesting version of that, a modern day version, if you will. It's a bunch of paper plates. Um, all of those plates are upside down, except for one. If you find the one that's upside, that's right side up, then all of the other stimuli will flip and appear, or plates will flip and appear to be right side up as well. So you can get the picture there, the paper plates, to appear as either the paper plates being upright or as the paper plates being upside down. 
because I guess our visual system concludes, well, if one's upright, they must all be upright. And if one's upside down, I guess they all are. Uh, another example of uh, the need for top-down or the use of top-down information um, or unconscious inference, to use a Helmholtzian phrase, is something called apparent motion. Every time you go to the movies, and someday, hopefully soon, we'll be able to go to the movies again, uh, we go in and there's a big screen and it's filled with images of people moving around and things happening in car chases, right? Now, we know that the film itself that's being projected in a projector is actually a bunch of stationary pictures, like are shown here. These are pictures from a, a guy named Moybridge, who um, was hired by a fellow named uh, Leland Stanford. You may have heard of him, he created a university. Uh, back in the day, people wanted to figure out how horses ran, and there was a big debate about whether there was ever a point when horses ran that all four of their feet, or I guess hooves, were off the ground. So this is Moybridge taking pictures of the horse gait to try to figure out if there's ever a point where horses have all of their feet off of the ground, and there is, actually. Um, but uh, th this was, he took those pictures before there were movie cameras, right? So he took static pictures, and what did he do? He, he created a flip book. He showed one picture quickly after the other picture, and that gives rise to not a bunch of stationary pictures, but of something moving. Our visual system thinks that if we see a bunch of static pictures of one thing right after the other, that that seems unlikely. It must be the same object moving. So I'll show you um, an example of apparent motion just here in a second. We've all seen signs like this before, where the lights appear to be moving. But how exactly can a light bulb be in motion? Imagine for a second that you have two lights. First, this light turns on and off, then the next light turns on and off. What most people perceive is motion. Just like that sign over there, the lights are blinking on and off. Your brain pieces together the motion from one spot to the next. Okay. Every time you watch a movie or your favorite TV show, your brain is being tricked into seeing motion that isn't really there. So what you're watching right now is really just one big illusion. You're seeing a series of still images strung together very quickly so your brain sees motion. This is called apparent motion. Okay, so that was apparent motion. Um... I want to finish up here with a discussion of Gestalt grouping principles. So Gestalt psychologists um, uh, got together uh, years ago and figured out, you know what? There's got to be some rules to perception. There has to be something there that drives how we interpret stimuli. So they spent a lot of time studying that and they developed these rules um, that they believe your brain uses to interpret stimuli. So one of those rules um, is that something in the figure has to be in front and other things can be in back. This is called figure ground. Um, and you can flip back and forth in figure ground illusions, uh, figure ground demonstrations. So for example, on the far left on the bottom, you might see two black faces in front of a white background and the two faces are facing each other. But look at that some more. Can you get your mind to see that as a white vase in front of a black background? Can you flip figure and ground? Focus on the white background and see that as a vase up in front, and then let the vase become the background. Figure ground. Uh, the Gestalt has figured out that we tend to perceptually close things, so they created a rule called closure. Um, so for example, in the triangle and circle that you see here, uh, they're defined by dashed lines. Our perceptual system closes them up, right? And we see a triangle. Uh, we group things together if they're near each other. The Gestaltists call this their rule of proximity. So things that are close together tend to be grouped together. In the um, uh, drawing here, 
next to the word proximity, you might see three pairs of lines grouped together. Uh, we also group by similarity. So for example, on a basketball team, people on the same team all wear the same color jersey because it's easy to group them together as a team that way. Um, in the uh, drawings here, you can see, if you want to, a row of yellow circles and a row of blue circles grouping together by similarity. You could also see vertical lines grouped by similarity, right? The vertical lines are go from yellow, blue, yellow, blue, blue, yellow, blue. Uh, the Gestaltists argue that um, another rule that we use is something they called good continuation. And that is um, if something is partially occluded by something else, how do we figure out what's the shape of the occluded thing? Um, well, they argued that we tend to parse images so that line segments continue smoothly so that they don't have big corners or breaks in them. So for example, in the drawing that you see now, there's uh, a pair of overlapping lines. We see them as a pair of overlapping lines. Each line is smooth and undulating. Uh, we tend not to interpret the stimulus on the left as um, two sharp edges, right? two sharp corners. That's good continuation. Another Gestaltist principle is common fate. If things move together, they group together. So for example, we see a school of fish because they're moving when the fish move in the same direction. The central idea for Gestaltists was a rule that they called simplicity, or I don't speak German, but if I did, my guess would be it's something like the law of prognaz, um, principle of simplicity, that um, we interpret everything in the most simple way possible. Now, the problem with this rule is it's hard to define simple, right? So it gets to be kind of circular. But the idea here is if we see the Olympic rings, we interpret them as five rings and not as this complicated shape that's shown on the bottom of your slide, even though we could. Um, on the right, I interpret that stimulus as the word max. Um, Gestaltus would argue that that's the simplest interpretation. The Gestalt grouping rules and other perceptual rules that scientists have studied um, a lot of times reflect the constraints of the environment that we grew up in. So we have lived all our whole lives in a world with gravity. So we would interpret things in terms of gravity. We've lived our whole lives with the sun being up in the sky. So now we have lights, it's a little confusing, but imagine 200 years ago or 300 or farther back than that, when we lived in a place and a time when the light that illuminated our world came from the sun. The sun never comes from our feet, it always comes from above, and it turns out that images, that we, that we interpret images in a way that's consistent with the sun being above. So for example, uh, if you look at the, on the right hand side on the bottom, there's a circle in the middle surrounded by six circles. It looks like the circle in the middle is concave, it's a hole, and that the circles around it are poofing out, that they're convex. Um, but that is just a function of the, the drawing. That assumption, that interpretation only works if the sun is above. So let me show you some examples um, here. Um, I'm gonna rotate these and you'll see that what appears to be concave will flip to convex and vice versa when I rotate the image coming out towards you or whether it's a hole and then now did it reverse did the one that you saw as a hole appear to poof out and the one that appeared to poof out now appears as a hole let me do it again did it work how about this one let's do the same thing so to me this looks like a hole and this looks like a hill and now I'm going to rotate it upside down. And it looks the same. That looks like a hole and that looks like a hill. And that looks like a hole and that looks like a hill. In other words, what was a hill 
oops, becomes a hole. Whether you see something as a hill or a hole depends upon our visual system's assumption that the sun, that the light that casts the shadows that makes these hills and holes, that the light's coming from above. So our visual system incorporates physical regularities in the world, like that the sun is above us, um, in a way that makes perfect sense, right? If we're supposed to use our knowledge and experience of the world to interpret images, then let's take advantage of the things that are constant in the world, like the sun is above and gravity works in a particular way. Okay, lastly, um, we also take advantage of regularities in meaning, not just regularities like where the sun is. So for example, uh, where do you normally see a football player or a soccer player? Where do you see them? In a stadium, right? Um, where do you normally see French fries? Well, in a, in a container of French fries, not in a cigarette box. It turns out your ability, how quickly you can recognize and how accurately you can recognize an object depends on the meaning of the context surrounding it. So you are more accurate um, and faster at recognizing the presence of a football player when that player is shown in the context of a football field than if that football player is shown inside of a house of worship, right? It's hard for us to recognize, to quickly recognize a boat if it appears in the middle of a street than if it appears in a lake. Uh, it takes us more time to recognize french fries in a cigarette box than in a container for french fries. So perception depends on your knowledge and expectations about the world. And that's where I'm going to leave lecture five. Thank you very much, students in my class. Time to head to Canvas. Take care.